Yeah, good morning, everybody. Welcome again in this wonderful historic courtroom. Uh, yes, my name is Annette Weinke. I'm a historian at uh, Friedrich Schiller University in Jena. And uh, it is my pleasure to be the moderator of this um, very first panel this morning, uh, which deals with uh, the Tokyo Judgment, uh, its origins and its relevance. Um, let me just thank the organizers again for this uh, fascinating um, event, for this fascinating conference. Let me also thank Kerstin, I mean, who obviously contributed um, to, the, uh, to the event. Um, I just want to say that I have been um, occupied with the history of uh, war crimes trials since the mid-90s, and uh, when I started in the 90s, I think it would have been unthinkable that a, a conference like this on Tokyo, uh, pardon me, is it too low? A little bit closer, all right, yeah. Um, so uh, when I started working on uh, war crimes trials in the, is it better right, right now? Is it better? Yeah, all right. Um, when I started working on uh, war crimes trials in the 90s, it would have been unthinkable that an event like this would have taken place here in Nuremberg, and um, this has to do with the fact that um, basically until the late 80s, early 90s, um, there, were, there was not much interest in the German public uh, for matters of human rights law, international criminal law. Um, and I would even say that there, were, that there was um, reservation uh, among the public, but also among uh, the political and legal um, elites of the old Federal Republic towards uh, issues of uh, international criminal law and um, Nuremberg. So uh, this has uh, changed very much uh, in the 90s and uh, also in the uh, 2000s, um, which obviously has to do with uh, the fact that people like Hans-Peter Kaul um, that he that that these that some people identified very strongly with uh, with these questions, and I think especially the the friendship between Hans Peter Kaul and uh, Benjamin Ferenc was one of the factors which uh, changed the um, attitude um, among uh, the West German public. Um, the the conference is also remarkable because. Um, as we can see, uh, a real dialogue uh, between historians and legal scholars has evolved in the last 20 years. So this is also something very unusual. Um, and um, I think this has to do with the fact, first of all, that international criminal law um, has gained much prominence in the, in the public, uh, but also uh, due to some historiographical um, trends. Um, I mean, the, um, the fact that um, history um, as a discipline opened up to international um, developments, also the a couple of um, cultural turns um, contributed to the fact that now historians um, are really, yeah, very interested in questions of international criminal law. I would say that international criminal law is one of the most vibrant fields for intellectual exchange between historians and um, legal scholars. So um, we, this first panel um, deals, as I said, with the um, um, genesis of the uh, Tokyo trial, and um, so I'm very happy that I have uh, three distinguished scholars here. Um, I would like to uh, introduce um, Kerstin von Lingen, uh, who's a dear colleague, uh, an old uh, friend of mine. I mean, we have been, we know each other for decades, I would always almost say, um, and she is certainly uh, the most um, important specialist uh, for, the, for issues of uh, 
yeah, the, the Asian war crimes trials here in Germany. Uh, there are hardly any experts for this issue in Germany. So uh, she is a historian as well, um, a senior re researcher, and right now she um, is a, a visiting professor at the Institute of Contemporary uh, History at the Vienna University. Uh, Kerstin has been uh, um, an independent, has been the leader of an independent research group at Heidelberg uh, University, where she uh, led the cluster um, um, of excellence, Asia and Europe in a global, no, actually this was, I'm, I'm wrong. <laughs> With these clusters, I always get confused. So basically you were part, your project was part of the cluster, uh, Asia and Europe in a global context, and, and you led the research group on transcultural justice, legal flows and the emergence of international justice within the East Asian war crimes uh, trials 46 to 40, uh, 55. Uh, she supervised um, four doctoral dissertations uh, on um, yeah, Soviet, Chinese, Dutch, and French war crimes trials. Uh, and right now she came out with uh, a new book on the issue of uh, the Tokyo Tribunal. It's called Transcultural Justice at the Tokyo Tri Tribunal, um, the Allied Struggle for Justice, 46 to 48. So, Kerstin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Annette, for this very kind introduction. And uh, um, um, it has been uh, mentioned several times already that uh, I've been the inspirator for this conference. I'm very honored uh, that this has been said. But on the other hand, I would very much like to thank the Nuremberg Academy for inviting everybody over because from an idea to all these eminent scholars now sitting in front of us, this is always a long way. And uh, I'm very, very grateful that this has been possible. Thanks to the organizers, thanks to Viviane Dietrich and Eduardo Toledo um, for, for taking the lead in that. Thank you very much. So, um, sorry that uh, this is um, also the moment where I can shamelessly just uh, show you the latest book on Tokyo, which has been out only three weeks now. So, it's definitely the last publication on the Tokyo Tribunal in Europe, I guess. Um, Transcultural Justice is the title of our um, research group at Heidelberg and four members of my Heidelberg group are here today and tomorrow, so you'll hear more about that uh, in due course. Um, I would just like to mention that uh, we have been able to negotiate with Brill publishers that everybody who's here at the conference uh, is entitled to a discount, so you can find these discount flyers over there in case you're really interested in all this transcultural stuff. So. Um, um, the Tokyo Tribunal was held uh, from May 46 until November 48 under its official heading, uh, International Military Tribunal for the Far East. And the name, as Boyster and Cryer have noted, echoes an Orientalist approach and would therefore be better replaced by either the Tokyo IMT or the Tokyo Tribunal. So I'm uh, further on talking about the Tokyo Tribunal. Um, we believe the war crime trials, um, like the Tokyo Tribunal, are to be studied not only uh, as the scene of battles between, uh, for justice between defense and prosecution, but also arenas uh, of constant negotiation. So it is thus important that research takes a closer look at the impact of the different cultural, uh, linguistic, political, and legal traditions um, of the various participants of the tribunal's planning and operation. So within our research group, we have coined the term transcultural justice to describe this variety. And we think that by restoring agency to all 11 national teams, judges and prosecutors alike, it is possible to better uh, situate um, the significance of individual contributions to verdict and thus bringing back maybe even a bit sidelined actors to the scene. The Tokyo Tribunal has always been perceived as being a one-man American show, and my real hope is that after this conference you won't believe that anymore. Um, as you know, the tribunal indicted uh, 28 defendants, of them 25 were fit to stand trial, um, former prime ministers, cabinet ministers, military leaders, diplomats, and displayed an impressive list of 55 charges. 
It was one of the first international tribunals in history, and it was surely an interracial and multilingual trial. Um, so we have 11 judges, you can see them here, um, and we have also 11 prosecution teams, um, and a mixed uh, Japanese-US team of defense lawyers. Much to the failure, which was later attributed to the Tokyo Tribunal, can be traced back to the unease of British and American observers to the anonymity of the verdict. Um, and I'll elaborate on that later on. Um, and there was later then also no interest in publishing the trial transcript, or at least a selection of it, as had been the case in Nuremberg already in 48. So as a consequence, the trial at Tokyo has fallen a bit into oblivion for, for decades and has only been rediscovered also by scholars um, in the early 80s, as we have heard yesterday by Yuma. So the idea of holding an international trial goes back to this Potsdam Declaration. Um, and um, the charter of Tokyo was modeled after the Nuremberg Charter. So we have again three charges, crimes against peace, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. Um, so the main focus is on aggression. Uh, the selection process of judges was quite difficult. Um, first, we have nine judges who have been nominated following the um, instrument of surrender. Um, and then later, uh, the limitation on this surrender signatories prompted some criticism by the Indian and the Philippine delegation who also held a seat in the Far Eastern Commission in Japan um, and uh, could successfully claim um, a seat on the bench as well. So we end up with 11 judges. But due to this late nomination, uh, when the IMTFE opened on 3 May uh, 46 in Tokyo, only the initially nine judges had so far arrived in Japan. So I think we can observe special characteristics of this trial. Um, the selection of judges showed more political than legal preferences, um, is a bit my impression. So controversial was the US decision of non-indictment of the emperor, which was motivated by political considerations. Um, the dismissal of bacteriological warfare charges was a constant frustration, especially for the Soviet Union, as they had obviously hoped for disclosure of detail and data. And this disappointment later gave them way to hold their own trial at Khabarovsk, and I think Valentina Polunina will speak about that tomorrow. Um, a topic which uh, is a failure, at least in retrospect, uh, from our perspective today, a major failure is the non-indictment or the... the um, less indictment of uh, sexual slavery, um, and we will hear more about that uh, later on the panel, I think. Um, as already in Nuremberg, also the Tokyo Tribunal was then criticized for the more representative than comprehensive selection of defendants, and uh, there was also a perceived Anglo-American domination of the trial, and the five Commonwealth judges were initially seen as a block until the discord of Judge Pal from India becomes apparent. But this is also the moment I would like to highlight to you that I think the Australian and the British contribution is very crucial to the Tokyo Tribunal. So what is special about Tokyo? The, uh, what I find really remarkable is that we have female attorneys at Tokyo. Scholarship has not yet comprehensively addressed the gender dimension of the Tokyo Tribunal, as there were several female attorneys, especially in the US uh, prosecution team, but we have also a Dutch prosecutor. This is a picture of her, uh, Komi Strokodantra, um, was part of the uh, Dutch delegation, and uh, she was also from Asia, so this is remarkable too. It is still open to research. Um, whether um, the employment of female colleagues was a side effect of the shortage of personnel uh, at Tokyo or a purposeful experiment based on skillful merit. The fact remains that Tokyo was uh, really a pioneer in this regard uh, and thus more modern than, for example, the tribunal at Nuremberg where women were employed in large part only as stenotypists and secretaries. There was also a mixed defense team, you can see it here, but it suffered from a lack of time to prepare, language difficulties, inferior translation facilities, and lo logistic issues, such as the shortage of desks, typewriters, paper, and money. <laughs> 
The selection process of judges was complicated and some nations had considerable difficulties to nominate a suitable candidate, although many saw it as a real national duty uh, in view to the post-war settlement to be represented at Tokyo. For example, the Dutch and French example shows in this direction. Um, I would really like to contradict what has been said yesterday, that we have only second best prosecutors, judges coming to Tokyo. I think that's not true. Um, a common feature was, however, that judges or prosecutors who had been nominated frequently declined. But that has more to do with um, uh, the, let's say, slightly unattractiveness of being sent far away, again, away from families. Uh, and um, while national foreign policy uh, clearly prioritized uh, the European theater of war. Um, British Foreign Secretary Ernest Bevin framed the British strategy, however, as a kind of moral duty, and I'm quoting him here. This trial is of considerable significance to us because of the important role which we played in the Far East, and also because of the tremendous effect which the Pacific War had on large numbers of British subjects and on important British territories. Also, the prosecution was under, organized under US leadership as Joseph Keenan headed the international prosecution section. Uh, however, look at the picture. All national teams send in their prosecutors and um, the Tokyo legal staff was uh, composed in my eyes of men with legal excellence to lead the prosecution. So we have Arthur Commons Carr of Britain to lead the British team with Christmas Humphreys as one of his joiners. We have Govinda Menon from India with Krishna Menon as his junior. And we have, uh, last but not least, Sergei Golinsky from the Soviet Union as a jurist and diplomat who had attended the conference of Dumbarton Oaks and Yalta and Potsdam. So Keenan saw the British prosecutor Comms Carr as his adversary, while the Commonwealth staff in turn thought him incompetent. So in handling the trial, it is agreed that every prosecution team had his uh, national prosecution phase, so it's responsible for several charges of the indictment, which lasts about six weeks and gave national teams the possibility to center on certain topics. So from these national phases, we can get some insights into the national narratives of the Pacific War and analyze the different strategies. So uh, I would like to highlight the French phase in this regard. Uh, the French legacy was highly contested due to the former alliance of Vichy France with Japan until March 4th. And it was one of the achievements of the French prosecutor Robert Oneto, you can see him in the middle, uh, within, um, to, to switch that narrative to a rightful partner sitting in judgment. He also achieved a major linguistic victory, let's put it like that, as he refused to speak in English and delivered a whole French prosecution section in French. So obviously the Soviets immediately followed suit and were also delivering their face in Russian. Um, I will now identify five fields of friction. Judges varied greatly about in how they were affected by their different legal backgrounds and by daily challenges to life far away from home. Um, issues ranged from accommodation, very unstable postal delivery and um, the difficulty to have contact with family at home, and they resented the absence of their wives or the travel ban to visit home, which was a real problem, um, and exceptions were only granted to President Webb from Australia and Justice Jaraniya from the Philippines, uh, who had their wives with them, and Judge Pal from India, who frequently returned home. A special case in point uh, were issues related to status. Here we should mention the Chinese judge, um, May, who complained about the seating order on the bench and was uh, raising complaints on his car number plate because all that uh, needed to reflect his high status. So the sheer length of the trial is a problem and then also um, we have frictions in the national teams. A last problem is the absence of um, judges during the defense phase of the trial which uh, shows a certain disbalance um, in proportion. Uh, so the language barrier was a problem in the Tokyo Tribunal. Uh, two judges, Zaryanov uh, and Bernard, could not even speak English and understand English. Um, obviously, there were translators, but uh, the problem was to get uh, in touch uh, with, the, um, with uh, the other judges on the bench as well. This problem is perpetuated going down the ranks because 
usually lower ranks would speak better English and even Japanese. Then we have a clash of legal cultures. So we have this clash between continental law and common law. Um, we have discussions about the strategy uh, to non-indict the emperor uh, and this focus on crimes against peace. Um, and we ha even have issues of um, uh, racism on the bench. I think Melindo Banerjee uh, will uh, raise that point in his talk as well. So the fourth point is management of the trial. So um, William Webb has been really criticized to be unable to manage the growing discord of the bench. We have these translation difficulties and we have uh, the issue, <laughs> you're laughing, but uh, bench, um, Webb was the only processor of a microphone on the bench. So for the other judges, it was impossible to intervene directly. So finally, the social life in Tokyo is a very interesting point of research for historians. So um, we have personal problems which had to do with the feeling of otherness and maybe even loneliness in a foreign country. But we can also see fractions emerging and friendships uh, evolving. So we have accounts about dinner parties and touristic trips through Japan. For example, a prosecution team trip to Mount Fuji, which saw the Dutch, the US, and the Chinese members traveling. And here you see a picture of um, Saryanov and um, the US Judge Kramer laughing together at a dinner party. And I uh, would argue that we can, uh, this hints as a kind of professional comradeship at Tokyo between the foreign judges and prosecutors, which went beyond Cold War realities. So when discussing finally uh, the criticism of the Tokyo trial being a failure, several elements can be detected. I think one main thing is that the British um, especially were very disappointed that it was not unanimous, the verdict. So we have these quotes from the British Lord Chancellor Javid, who said, if Tokyo fails, it may discredit Nuremberg. And we have Asla Denning saying, we have a predominantly Western tribunal uh, sitting in judgment in the Far East to try Japanese war criminals. If this fails, Western justice will become the laughing stock, not only of Japan, but of the Far East in general. So it's the court in Tokyo it appeared to be the last opportunity to show the world uh, the supremacy of Western values. I'm afraid you have to wrap it up. Can I can wrap it up. Okay, so the conclusion is that the transnational impact of the experience made in Tokyo uh, shows these certain dynamics in court, uh, but the Cold War obscures the impact of sidelined actors. Um, but I believe that Tokyo produced a broader variety of justice as it gave more actors a voice. So uh, I think we have more influence from smaller countries than uh, we have hitherto really um, researched into us. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. <coughs> Thanks a lot, um, Kerstin, for this uh, very interesting uh, paper. So, our next speaker will be uh, Dr. Beatrice Trifal, Trifal? Yeah. from uh, Monash University. She is uh, Associate Professor uh, of Japanese Studies at uh, Monash University um, at the School of Languages, Cultures, Literatures and Linguistics. Um, she is a co-author of a volume on, which is called a Japanese War uh, Criminals, uh, The Politics of Justice After World War II, which came out uh, with Columbia University Press in 2017. Um, and she has published extensively um, on the uh, history of the French prosecutions of uh, war crimes trials, the uh, repatriation of uh, Japanese war criminals from the Philippines, Japanese veterans, um, and the battlefield experiences of uh, Japanese civilians in the Pacific. And currently, she is working on the impact of um, post-war repatriation uh, on early post-war domestic politics in, in Japan. So um, today, um, she uh, will give us a presentation which uh, deals with the legacy, with the memorial uh, legacy of the Tokyo trials, um, then and now, the Japanese domestic context of the IMT FE.
Thank you. Can you hear me all right? A little bit closer. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Beatrice Trafalt. I'm from Monash University in Australia, which means that I'm remarkably jet-lagged, and I apologise in advance for any kind of weird elements of this paper, which I've also tried to reduce to something very short. But I want to start off by thanking the Nuremberg Academy for inviting me here today. Um, as um, Annette was saying, I'm a historian. I'm not a legal person. I'm someone who tries to understand the domestic context of the Tokyo trial. And in my longer paper, um, I bookend my discussion in two ways. I start with the uh, recent 2016 miniseries Tokyo trial, which in my view gives Japanese participants in the trial a very marginal space. And I finish my paper with uh, a reference to um, Nippon Kaigi, a right-wing conservative loose association of uh, politicians and public intellectuals who, amongst other things, uh, want to revise the constitution, but also want to uh, undermine the legacy of the Tokyo trial as a, providing Japanese people with a wrong understanding of the Second World War. And I want to undermine both ideas. I want to undermine the idea that Japanese people in, during the occupation were marginal witnesses to this trial. And I also want to undermine the idea that the show that was um, presented, the narrative that was presented during the Tokyo Tribunal, was accepted um, uncritically by the Japanese population. My idea is that, in fact, there was a constant discussion about it. And so I'm going to um, summarize this paper in, in sort of three parts. The first part is talking about the trial um, and the response to the trial between 46 and 48. Um, looking at the transformation of ideas of the trial and the introduction of a class element into the trials by considering the uh, issue of BC war criminals and their um, presence in the domestic sphere uh, after 1951 and during the early 50s, and then make a further comment about the enshrinement of war criminals at Yaskuni in um, the 70s and what that tells us about the position of the war crimes trials. Now, the first point is about the occupation. The occupation had a mission of demilitarization and democratization that relied on the core idea that the blame for the war was attached to a minority of people who had misled the bulk of the population. And the corollary, therefore, was that one of the occupation force's crucial roles was the re-education of Japanese people. This re-education aimed to bring Japanese people at large to understand and condemn Japanese wartime leaders' actions and moral corruption in bringing Japan into the war, um, to become informed about the despicable actions of Japanese troops in occupied territories and against prisoners of war, and furthermore, to understand how a lack of civic participation in the government before and during the war contributed to these outcomes, thus providing pedagogical underpinnings to all occupation reforms aiming to democratize Japan. I'm not suggesting here that the uh, Tokyo trial was explicitly part of this re-education program or that it was fundamentally shaped by its imbrication into the occupation's wider program of propaganda and censorship. The point is rather that because of this occupation context, the Tokyo trial was a, daily, uh, was a part of daily life for Japanese people. Information about the trial was very public, it was plentiful, its progression was the subject of near daily reports in the newspapers, its contents were laid out against numerous other reports and information about the war. Even the words AQ Senpan, A-level war criminal, became a byword for someone despised and badly treated. In that sense, Neil Boyce's assessment of the Tokyo trial as having an element of a show trial rings true from the point of view of the Japanese population. The question was whether this show was convincing. Just as there were a range of attitudes towards the propaganda of the occupation, in the words of William Coughlin, selling democracy as though it was an advertising campaign for a new soap, attitudes towards the trial were also multi-layered, complex, and fluid. And in the Kind of intervening part of this paper, I explain what the kind of range of attitudes are, but I don't have time to go into it uh, just now. As the world awaited the judgment in September 1948, 
The widely read mag monthly magazine Chuo caught on contained an analysis of the trial by legal scholar Yoko Takisaburo, who emphasized repeatedly two central points. First, the trial provided a critical reckoning of the past, and second, it marked a crucial starting point for the future of Japan and of the world at large. And what Okoda was fighting against was what he perceived to be an understanding amongst the population that the trial was deeply flawed. And he was saying, actually, it's symbolic elements as a break between the past and the present, uh, sorry, uh, between past and present and future, and the starting point of, of, of a new future Japan uh, was more important than um, its function as a role, as a legal uh, instrument to determine guilt. So Japanese readers were reading those kinds of arguments, and at the same time, they were also presented with a range of cynical assessments about the trial com coming from international uh, newspapers as well. On the 14th of November 48, for example, readers of the Asahi Shimbun were provided with translated selections from the editorials of international newspapers. The New York Times suggested, only half-heartedly, that perhaps the Japanese people had now been provided with a proper lesson about their participation in politics. The Washington Tribute was questioning the absence of the emperor on the dock. Um, newspapers in the Philippines, where they were shown, were even more discouraged by the ability of the trial to produce proper self-reflection and atonement, and questioned the very nature of the Japanese national character. Um, after that, there's, there's um, daily reports on the um, death penalty, um, on the construction of the gallows, and eventually on the ex execution of all criminals, and then uh, very soon after, um, in um, December 1948, about the release of remaining A-level um, uh, accused from Sugamo prison because the trials were now over. And this leads me to the second period that I want to discuss. Lessons about the war and the transformation of Japan into a different kind of country, as flawed as these lessons were, were then crucial symbolic elements of the trial for Japanese audiences at the time. But soon another layer of complexity was added to attitudes about the trial by a shift of focus to trials conducted elsewhere and other convicted war criminals. At the conclusion of the Tokyo trial, there were still more than 1,200 prisoners in Sugamo prison in Tokyo either serving sentences or awaiting trial, as well as several hundred in jails overseas. Public opinion about these uh, war criminals were, was galvanized in January 1951 when 14 were executed in the Philippines. Petitions to the government about the repatriation of Japanese war criminals overseas redoubled. The conditions under which Japanese uh, convicted criminals were held overseas, not just criminals, but generally uh, Japanese overseas, um, sorry, petitions about the conditions in which Japanese overseas lived and awaited repatriation became part of an extensive domestic discussion about war crimes trials overseas, about the overseas incarceration of convicted war criminals, and the impact of this incarceration on their families waiting at home for the return of what was often the main breadwinner of the family. The shift of focus to these other war criminals also had an impact on the attitudes towards the Tokyo trials and towards the A-level war criminals. While some of the war tower leaders remained in jail, the majority of those incarcerated for war crimes were average people rather than the wartime political and military elite. According to a report published in the weekly magazine Shukan Asahi in February 1952, uh, I quote, um, there is a strong feeling among the prisoners that we have been made to shoulder the responsibility for the defeat. What was called the penitence of a hundred million people, so Ichioko Sozange, was at some point transformed into the narrower concept of war guilt, sensor sickening. And the war criminals alone ended up being the victims of this version of national guilt. A year later, uh, the magazine Kaizo uh, uh, carried an article tellingly entitled War Criminals Backstabbed, uh, in which Abe Kobo pointed out to his readers that, uh, that if anything, 
the trials of those convicted in BC trials were even more unfair than the Tokyo trial. In his views, and these were widely shared views, individuals had been left to take the blame for superior officers, had been made uh, to shoulder individually the blame for the actions of many, particularly when it came to the treatment of POWs, or had been falsely identified. So they were raising all kinds of issues about their trial. And ultimately, Abeko was suggested, all of these people had been put into untenable situations because of their actions of their own government. However, uh, Abe pointed out, on the 25th of January, 53, only 12 of the prisoners in Sugamo were A-level war criminals. There were more than 800 BC uh, war criminals serving out sentences. The element of class that these kinds of discussions introduced to the conception of the Tokyo trials also meshed neatly um, with other ways in which the experiences of the war were being discussed in the public sphere. Uh, in the case of soldiers in overseas battlefields, for example, especially those in Southeast Asia and the Pacific, a common trope in memoirs uh, during the 50s and 60s was the victimization of low-ranking conscripts by their superior officers, um, officers who were portrayed as brutal, willing to sacrifice many for little gain, uh, and making momentous life and death decisions for their men from a safe place well away from the front lines. And I think this kind of condemnation of you know, government level A level war criminals compared to BC war criminals fitted into this um, discussion. I'll now move to the last point I want to make, um, which is about the enshrinement of A-level war criminals in the Yasukuni Shrine in Tokyo in the mid-1970s, which in my view both fed on and further exacerbated the increasing polarization of views about the war. It is especially the presence of the war criminals convicted at the Tokyo trial, those executed in 48 and those who died later, that has fueled neighboring countries' protests about Japanese failures to repent and atone for the war. But just like every aspect of the Tokyo trial and its legacy in Japan, there are contradictory and complicating elements to this story. Now, since the Meiji period, the Yasukuni Shrine has been the place of repose for those who had given their lives as soldiers on the battlefield. Those convicted on the during the Tokyo trial, however, did not die on the battlefield, even if they were army men, and furthermore, they died well after the conclusion of the war in a legal process that was accepted by the Japanese government. Therefore, the enshrinement might appear to be a blatant rejection of the Tokyo trial and its judgments. But it's also really important to place this moment in the context of ongoing attempts by the Association of Bereaved Families to return Yasukuni Shrine to the status of a national institution. Many, but not all, uh, families of fallen soldiers consider that the post-war failure of the government to support the shrine, because of the post-war's constitution separation of church and state, um, amounts to an abdication of the state's responsibility to commemorate the sacrifice of fallen soldiers. Those lobbying the government for funding for the Yasukuni Shrine might have felt that their case would be stronger if the shrine also included the names of wartime elites and the predecessors of many of Japan's post-war politicians. An important member of the Bereaved Families Association since 1957 and one of its top officials in the 1970s was Itagaki Tadashi, the second son of uh, General Itagaki Seishiro, who was executed in 1948. Um, but the enshrining of A-level war criminals did not help to satisfy the Bereaved Families' demands that the government should officially support Yasukuni Shrine. If anything, it complicated matters even more because from that moment the emperor stopped visiting the shrine um, and uh, the shrine became the focus of Korean and Chinese condemnation. Hence, rather than resolving the issue of state recognition of wartime sacrifice, the enshrinement of war criminals created new problems, not least in making the status of Yasukuni even more controversial. Uh, but also because it removed from the list of visitors the emperor himself, which is a problem for, uh, a continuing problem for Japanese veterans. So whether war criminals were enshrined as a uh, gesture of rejection of the Tokyo trial or whether they were enshrined as a mean to attempt to give additional weight to the demands of bereaved families, 
um, that the state formally recognized Yasukuni Shrine. Their symbolic presence at Yasukuni has further exacerbated the polarization of views about the war and its role in Japanese history. So something that Professor on uh, Onuma was talking about yesterday. And it suggests that the show so carefully orchestrated during the occupation period did not tell a story that was believable. It was not convincing at the time because it was transparently attached to broader propaganda in the early days of the occupation. And its basis and assumptions were also immediately questioned at home and overseas and in ways that were immediately available to the Japanese public. In addition, the story that was told in the show about the impartial punishment of leaders and of those responsible for heinous crimes did not match the stories of others who were punished for war crimes in BC trials, who came home with stories of flawed trials and terrible conditions, and who felt that they, uh, rather than a few wartime leaders, were being made to bear the brunt of Japan's war guilt. It's in this broader context, not just in the walls of the courtroom itself, that we can achieve an understanding of the meaning of the Tokyo trial. Thank you very much. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Beatrice, and also thank you for the stimulating talk, and also thank you for keeping the time. Our next um, speaker will be um, Professor Diane Orentlicher from American University. She's professor of law at American University. Um, I think everybody who is um, interested in uh, the history of international criminal law, transitional justice, has come across her name. Actually, I read um, some of your works already in the um, 90s when you were involved into the emergence of these transitional, transitional justice networks. Um, so, <clears throat> actually, she has uh, lectured and published widely on um, human rights law, international criminal justice. Um, she has um, acted as an advisor for um, several state institutions and institutions of um, international law, um, for example, uh, for the um, uh, she, um, she acted as for the um, Deputy of War Crimes issue at the U.S. Um, State Department between 2009 and 2011. Um, she also was an uh, advisor or an independent um, expert appointed by the uh, U.N. Secretary General uh, for the um, um, uh, combat, for combating uh, impunity. Um, and um, she just uh, brought out a new book and came out three weeks ago, right? Yeah. Called um, Some Kind of Justice. And um, I think this is a very interesting topic and it's very rarely done because you were actually uh, trying to explore the, uh, the impact of the ICTY on the communities uh, in uh, former Yugoslavia. This is very rarely done, and I'm really looking forward to read your book. Thank you. Please. With others, I am very grateful to the International Nuremberg Principles Academy for inviting me to speak, um, and of course, um, really strongly commend them for organizing this important conference. Uh, the book that was just mentioned um, looks at the impact of the Yugoslavia War Crimes Tribunal over the 24 and a half years of its operation on local communities. Um, and one of the themes that came through so strongly in the course of writing the book is that the impact of a, an international tribunal uh, is hardly static and continues to evolve and change um, in a society uh, over time, and that its impact hardly stops when its work ends, as the, as the Nuremberg and Tokyo experiences um, themselves very powerfully illustrate. Um, and so it's a uh, an opportune time to take the measure again of the uh, Tokyo Tribunal. Um, like others who have already spoken, when I came of age as a young international lawyer, if you wanted to do research on the Tokyo Tribunal, um, as Richard Cryer found, um, mentioned last night, it was really hard to find resources on the subject. Um, and, and when leading scholars on international criminal law talked about the early um, genesis of our field, they would 
almost invariably refer to Tokyo as an afterthought. They would discuss Nuremberg in depth and then say, and Tokyo, um, sometimes literally, um, sometimes parenthetically, and Tokyo. Um, and so, uh, and, and when they did acknowledge the Tokyo precedent, it was often um, quite critically. Uh, and so against that background, um, with others who've already spoken, it's been, I think it's been um, extraordinarily important um, that the past couple of decades have seen a, a really vital resurgence of surgence of literature revisiting virtually every aspect of the Tokyo Tribunal. Um, so uh, one of the consequences, there are many, of the fact that um, the Tokyo Tribunal for so long did not receive anything near the attention it merits or the attention Nuremberg received is that some of its distinctive contributions to international criminal law were um, long obscured, and although that's changed, uh, it continues to be the case to some extent that even experts in international criminal law are unaware of its historic contributions to some aspects of um, international law. I'm going to use the example of the Tokyo uh, Tribunal's treatment of crimes of sexual violence to illustrate the point, but to give you a sense of, of what I'm talking about. A very recent publication that just came out um, notes that the two ad hoc tribunals created by the UN Security Council in the 1990s, quote, were the first to recognize rape and sexual violence as forms of torture in the context of war crimes. There's a technical sense in which that may be accurate, um, but, the, but it misses the broader point that the, uh, the Tokyo Tribunal, in fact, um, uh, entertained extensive evidence on crimes of sexual violence, principally in the context of the rape of Nanjing, and found them to uh, constitute war crimes and convicted some defendants, in part based on that evidence. Before I elaborate on that point, I've been asked to um, very briefly provide an overview of the tribunal's creation with a view, uh, I, I think with a review of um, establishing a common founda foundation for those here who may not be as familiar as uh, most of the panelists are with the origins of the Tokyo Tribunal. Um, so the points I'm gonna very briefly make really um, uh, amount to, I think, two um, broad uh, uh, points. And those are that in many ways, the planning and preparation of, of Tokyo legally was derivative from Nuremberg. I think everybody here knows that, and I think the next panel is gonna develop that point in depth. Um, the second uh, sort of broad point that I think will come out is that um, like the Nuremberg Tribunal, the Tokyo Tribunal was um, in, in, in many ways a product of American planning, in fact, even more so than Nuremberg, but both were a uh, result of American initiative in some crucial ways, nonetheless, for reasons that have already come out and that I'll touch on briefly, the Tokyo Tribunal has been seen much more as an American project. Um, so briefly, uh, planning for Nuremberg is, um, in, in a sense, a, a critical part of the record of planning for Tokyo, precisely because key aspects of the Tokyo Tribunal, starting with its charter, um, and as well as its courtroom were modeled on Nuremberg. So uh, a planning for Nuremberg, um, as I indicated, and again, I think most people here know this, um, began with a strong push within the um, United States government uh, to have a war crimes trial, um, potentially on a broader scope than what we actually saw. Um, the United States uh, there was a, a lot of um, argument about what to do about this within the U.S. government that I'm not going to go into, but once the United States re reached a consensus on this, it had a lot of work to do to persuade its allies um, to accept its vision of post-war prosecutions. At the London conference, um, which concluded with uh, the issuance of the Nuremberg Charter, Justice Jackson had to do extensive diplomatic work to persuade reluctant allies to go along with his vision, particularly his vision of um, the charge, the controversial charge of crimes against peace. 
uh, which were very controversial and were undoubtedly ex post facto. Um, the other controversial uh, uh, innovation in the Nuremberg Charter in terms of its recognition of crimes was that of uh, crimes against humanity. At the end of the conference, though, um, the four uh, big powers did agree on those, um, all of those charges, and the Nuremberg Charter um, had the imprimatur of four countries that had negotiated together and jointly promulgated a charter. Um, in contrast, uh, uh, as is, is well known, the, um, the Tokyo Charter was promulgated formally by one person, a U.S. commander, General um, MacArthur, uh, and, and that is one of the many reasons why it is seen as um, primarily uh, an American enterprise. That said, as was already noted, I think um, its legal authority derived in, in a significant way from the Pro um, Potsdam Declaration, um, which was jointly issued by three of the big powers in uh, fighting the war against Japan and then subsequently endorsed by the Soviet Union as well. Um, I'm not going to go into details about this, but I think one of the uh, points that's worth just noting is that, as others have suggested, some of the early perceptions of the Tokyo Tribunal bear re-examination. One of them um, that was already suggested is that, on closer look, the Tokyo Tribunal is not as much of a um, singular creature of American planning as, um, as is often perceived. Um, that said, it's important to uh, recognize that um, all of the serious groundwork for planning the Tokyo Charter was done in Washington, and allies of the Americans were brought into the planning only later. It was promulgated initially, as I said, by um, Justice MacArthur as a singular act. That said, he later amended the charter as a result of um, uh, uh, suggestions by colleagues who, um, who, who wanted him to make a couple of amendments, one of which was to accommodate um, the appointment of a uh, Filipino and um, an Indian judge. Um, Somebody on the next panel, Philip Austin, is going to talk about the charges, uh, there, which were modeled um, the, the principal charges that were recognized in the Charter of the Tokyo Tribunal. So I'm not going to go into depth about them except simply to say that they were taken from the Nuremberg Charter but modified somewhat to accommodate the specific context um, of, uh, of the Tokyo uh, war crimes charges. Um, the one uh, significant difference um, that had uh, an, an impact, or at least was reflected in the overall orientation of the prosecution in Tokyo, is that um, the Tokyo Charter allowed for the prosecution of persons, individuals before that tribunal only if they were charged with crimes against peace. Um, uh, they were also charged with war crimes, but they could only be charged with war uh, crimes against peace. This very much reflected um, the American vision of what the um, emphasis should be uh, in the Tokyo Tribunal. The American prosecutor, um, Joseph Keenan, took that mandate to focus in particular um, on crimes against peace very much to heart. And so well into the prosecution phase of the Tokyo trial, he suggested to the allied prosecutors that they um, e either significantly shorten or even drop um, the war crimes charges and, and have the prosecution consist solely of uh, allegations relating to the crime of aggressive war. Other allied prosecutors pushed back strenuously, fortunately, um, and he retreated from his suggestion and allowed this uh, evidence of war crimes to be introduced. As a result of that, um, a truly voluminous amount of evidence um, became part of the official record of the Tokyo Tribunal. As I think most people here know, among the um, evidence that was introduced, um, and in some depth, was evidence of um, rapes of women, mass rapes of women, in the course of the trial. Particular emphasis, uh, in fact, um, overwhelming emphasis was placed on uh, crimes of sexual violence during the rape of Nanjing in 1937 and 1938. In addition, evidence of sexual violence in several other locations, including Manila, Hong Kong, uh, and the Haipei province, was introduced as well um, and, um, uh, and was credited by the um, tribunal. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, 
that the uh, tribunal did not, as I think was mentioned uh, last night, did not go provide an in-depth analysis of this evidence. It noted um, rather that it was, quote, not practicable to provide an in-depth review of the evidence, but it clearly credited the evidence of rape um, and condemned it in no uncertain terms. Um, okay, let me say a couple of points uh, in, in wrapping up. Um, so fast forwarding several decades, at the time that the ICTY, the Yugoslavia War Crimes Tribunal was created, there was a global concern that this tribunal would not give adequate attention to crimes of sexual violence. And a global um, movement of women's rights activists working in alliance with um, survivors of rape in Bosnia uh, mobilized to ensure that the ICTY would give adequate attention to this. Um, the, the tribunal's um, uh, statute did not explicitly use the word rape um, in its enumeration of war crimes, uh, but the tribunal had little um, trouble uh, concluding that, it, that rape was included in, um, in war crimes charges. Nonetheless, um, be, both because of this global concern and because the word wasn't uh, mentioned in its uh, statute, um, the prosecutor asked uh, a project that I worked with at the time to, um, to do research on what precedents there were to support charges of sexual violence under the statute of the ICTY. So we did extensive analysis of post-war prosecutions, which had not been um, used uh, in, obviously, in, before an international prosecution for decades. Um, and one of our most extensive memoranda dealt with the, the evidence and the conclusions regarding sexual violence at the Tokyo Tribunal. Again, I don't think the prosecutor of the ICTY had any doubt that these were valid charges, but very much welcomed um, the fact that we had a strong precedent to stand on to support that. Um, the treatment of, the Tokyo, of sexual violence by the Tokyo Tribunal obviously also leaves much to be desired. Um, there were some aspects even of its treatment of sexual violence as a war crime um, that can be criticized, particularly by today's lights. But the most critical um, uh, uh, aspect of it, or, or the, the aspect of the judgment that most uh, has merited and received criticism is that it barely mentions the crime of forced prostitution. Uh, it's mentioned in passing. Um, in the judgment, and there was obviously extensive evidence available at the time, some of which was introduced into evidence that could have supported a more focused prosecution of this. Despite these um, uh, concerns um, about a very serious omission, um, the Tokyo Tribunal offers us, I think, a very precious legacy. Um, it, uh, even its omission um, is a valuable lesson learned. Um, and one that has been taken to heart and one that we have to continue to pay attention to um, in prioritizing charges um, in post-war prosecutions and in others. Um, but in, in as well, the fact that uh, voluminous evidence of these sexual violence crimes has been was introduced into the official record of Tokyo, I think, uh, continues to provide um, a, a, an invaluable um, resource for historians and citizens and others uh, who want to recover um, and reassess the history of war crime atrocities. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much, Diane, and also thank you for keeping your time. I actually have one uh, short question, um, because I have been dealing with um, European lawyers uh, who emigrated to the United States in the 30s and 40s, and so, I mean, it's uh, apparent that um, they basically, uh, they were trained in continental law, so they were, were positivists, and they actually, they made their peace with Nuremberg, but they never made their peace with Tokyo. So, uh, some of the harshest critics of the Tokyo Tribunal are uh, lawyers, for example, like uh, Judith uh, Sklar, she's a political scientist, uh, also is a lawyer, um, and I probably you remember uh, that that she she called them uh, juridical gymnastics, um, and I mean, how do you explain that uh, the fact that um, yeah the 
the most prominent critics uh, against this um, event uh, come from the United States? So that's a great question, and I hope it's uh, one that lots of people will engage in. Um, I, you know, I think that's one aspect of a broader question that Richard Cryer raised last night, which is um, what are the myriad reasons why the Tokyo Tribunal hasn't enjoyed the same historical stature as Nuremberg. Um, so there were some, uh, some deficiencies um, that I think are well known. I, and I'm not going to go into depth on those because I think they're going to come up in um, other proceedings. I will say one of the things that fascinates me is that um, that American participants in the trial itself, as well as um, non-American participants, judges and others, um, from the outset uh, were quite outspoken in their criticism of the proceedings, um, the, the procedures and other aspects of the Tokyo Tribunal. And so uh, I have always thought that one part of the explanation for why it has been more critically assessed um, than Nuremberg, one part of it is that there was a robust debate from the outset, starting with the splintered opinions and, and above all, obviously, the blistering dissent of Justice Powell, but the splintering even among other judges who um, concurred with the majority opinion. There, there was a, a team of American defense lawyers who were brought over to work with the Japanese Defense Council. They put up a um, robust defense, and they were also very critical, and they also uh, published very critical journal articles um, after the trial, uh, as did some of the participants in the prosecution. Uh, participants in the prosecution, American participants, also wrote very favorable treatments um, immediately afterward. But you had this really extraordinary, I think, um, open uh, criticism immediately by mm -hmm. participants in the trial, including American ones. I, again, I want to acknowledge there are a lot of other reasons mm -hmm. why that's mm -hmm. the case, but mm -hmm. I think that was um, really Social. striking. And, it, and it, it, it contrasts with I think uh, what was more characteristic of the early reactions to the Yugoslavia War Crimes Tribunal, one of the concerns that many of its supporters had was that the um, lawyers who were paying attention to the ICTY were so eager for it to succeed that there was a hesitancy to criticize it when it would have been helpful for the tribunal to get that kind of critical feedback. Okay. The reactions to the Tokyo Tribunal, I think, oh, were very different. Okay. Somebody of you want to relate to this? Um. Well, um, I would maybe like to underline again that I think uh, one of the majest, major disappointments were this anonymity of the verdict. So, so this, this has been more or less the nightmare of, of what they had been planning because they were expecting a second Nuremberg and a kind of second um, success story. And obviously having a team of 11, this is very unlikely to expect them to speak with one voice. So just briefly. Well, I think um, certainly it's also really obvious in the Japanese context and immediately and very publicly, mm -hmm. this sort of notion that, you know, mm -hmm. this is open to criticism yeah. and um, that um, and that it's widely, it's widely held criticism by, you know, general newspaper readers yeah. who kind of say, well, you know, what, what are the legal bases for this trial? And then you have um, lawyers like Yokota saying, don't worry about that, you know, it's, it's symbolically it's more important than, than what Right. Now, I mean, in the West German case, I mean, you could uh, clearly see uh, some the emergence of some transnational, uh, transatlantic uh, variant of criticism, uh, basically, I mean, which had to do with the Cold War and with the rollback in American foreign policy. Uh, I don't know if there's a similar phenomenon uh, with regard to Japan. <clears throat> I think one of the... Um legacies of the occupation and, and, and to a lesser extent of the, the war crimes trials is the, the, the sudden shift of focus to the uh, relationship between Japan and the US when um, previously um, the relationship, the closest relationship that Japan had were with countries like China, well, you know, obviously not very good relationships but certainly very important ones. Mm -hmm. And I think we can um, overemphasize the American relationship in the early post-war period and um, 
underemphasized the kind of other ways in which, uh, you know, relationships with um, China and Korea mm -hmm. and neighbors continue to exist. Yeah, actually, I would like to open up here the debate and um, see some here, Elizabeth. Elizabeth first, yeah. Mm -mm. Um, thank you for this fantastic panel. What a great way to start this conference, the substantive part of this conference. Um, I just had a quick follow-up for Professor Orentlicker about, um, I mean, I served as a research assistant to Kurt Steiner, who was one of the assistant prosecutors, and he was always very frustrated by people saying that rape and sexual violence wasn't treated as a war crime at Tokyo. And he says, no, that's a myth. It was. We talked about it all the time. So is what you're saying that evidence was introduced and that, but what was, was it just called violence or, I mean, what was the piece that was missing? Was it not labeled? I understand sexual violence is a modern locution, but um, what was, it, was it just part of uh, the violence of um, violence against civilians? So the word rape was used repeatedly and so, there were a number of um, witnesses who were, the oral witnesses were men who were in, in Nanjing during um, the occupation and who testified, including a doctor who had treated victims, um, but other people who had offered protection to them. Then there were quite a few statements, affidavits introduced into the record as well um, about this. And it, was generally treated as part and parcel of um, a pattern of atrocities that occurred, including um, uh, mass uh, summary executions and um, brutal bayonettings and that sort of thing. Um, so depending on how you read it, I, I mean, the way I mostly read it is that it was recognized as being at, as grave as the other atrocities, and the word rape was used without hesitation. Um, and in fact, two of the witnesses who testified orally began, uh, uh, began their discussion of rape by saying, after discussing horrific, horrific killings, and you can't imagine anything worse than that. And then when they turned to sexual violence, they said, but the worst part was. And so they were hardly denigrating it. You know, obviously, it took massive um, it, rapes on a massive, massive scale to warrant that kind of attention, I guess. Um, but it was treated as as really um, worthy of condemnation. During the cross examination of the witnesses, there were some uh, some suggestions by one of the defense counsel that um, didn't uh, didn't Chinese troops do this too? Uh, didn't this last only a month or whatever? And and um, Justice Webb shut that down and sort of, you know he shut down a lot of things, but he made it clear that he considered those kinds of um, arguments as unacceptable. Um, this is there is no excuse for this kind of rape. So it was condemned um, strongly. And and again, so one of my points really is that that while we talk about how this was completely neglected until the 1990s. It wasn't completely neglected. There are things to criticize about the way it was treated, but it was hardly neglected. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Liu from the MIGT. And uh, I thank all the speakers for their excellent uh, presentation this morning. And uh, to follow up the uh, previous question, I just want to ask a question to Professor Dan uh, Oritnik, you know, on the uh, rape and the sexual violence. I just want to know what is the exact reason for the rape or sexual violence have been long neglected as a distinctive crime and the war crime, you know, in all those, you know, statues. You know, for instance, in the Tokyo and the uh, uh, Nuremberg Charter, in the Geneva Conventions, as well as in the statute of the ICTR and ICTR, rape and uh, sexual violence are not uh, as a distinct crime under the war crimes. Thank you. <laughs> 
Um, so if I understand the question, why was it not explicit, the word rape explicitly mentioned? Uh, that's an excellent question. And, and um, I should say, I, relevant to the previous question, um, the war crimes that were the basis of the convictions in the Tokyo Tribunal um, were uh, inhumane treatment. That, so the literal war crimes were inhumane treatment. And um, oh, this is so important. I've got to get this right. Uh, help me out if you remember it. It, it was uh, an aff affront to the private um, personal dignity. Thank you, Stephen Rapp. Personal dignity and rights. Um, and so uh, the word rape was not included. Um, I. So, so a, a common critique is that it was not included be, in part because it wasn't recognized as having, as, as amounting to as grave a crime uh, as it is, but also um, the phrase, which I've already forgotten, an affront to per, personal dignity, was seen as, um, uh, as reflecting the view that the matter of sexual violence is so delicate that you can't um, address it directly. And, um, and so there's this you know, sort of euphemism, um, which uh, was, and the very fact, as you know, that um, the laws of war use that kind of language was a concern to the office of the prosecutor of the ICTY when it was first established, and they tried to develop a sort of coherent strategy for prosecuting crimes of sexual violence. Um, and there was a lot of work done to try to figure out what kind of charges would most, would best capture um, the experience of survivors of sexual violence. Sorry, I was getting emphatic there. Um, and, and avoid those euphemisms, but also honor the um, sensibilities of female survivors who wanted to see their um, uh, their crimes ap appropriately recognized. I know that's sort of a roundabout way of um, answering your question. It's a great question, um, and it highlights the fact that it's taken us a long time to use the words um, explicitly. Uh, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court um, reflects a much more updated approach to those issues, explicitly using not only the words you mentioned, but also um, sexual slavery, et cetera. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Bill Pace, with the NGO Coalition for the International Criminal Court. Uh, I, I, I came and I'm looking very much forward to the extraordinary presentations on legal historical uh, expertise and, say, the legal scope. But what would help me, uh, if I'm thinking of the last 30 years, you would think of uh, Rwanda, uh, well, even before that, Cambodia, uh, Syria, Sudan, uh, now Myanmar. And the very first thing you'll hear is the human scope of what happened. And I'm wondering if, if, if uh, it would help me to know a little bit more about what after 70 years is the accepted human scope in terms of the war crimes and the crimes against humanity that occurred. If there was, in the end, 11 uh, governments that wanted to participate in this, if, if, if uh, just some statistics, because I don't s see them coming out, and it would be interesting to know. Thank you. Well, um, maybe to, to try to address this uh, question, I think um, um, from my historical point of view, looking back, um, I find it, for example, astonishing that the charge of crimes against humanity has not been used more widely and has not been used more thoroughly to really address these crimes against civilians. On the other hand, um, if we see this um, if we see the impact, and I think uh, Diane has mentioned that uh, it's an ongoing impact, and also Annette has pointed to that. So we, we are only starting now to realize how much impact it makes to hold a trial. I would maybe answer your question in a more broad way, that uh, during all my research on war crime trials in Europe and in Asia, I get the impression that 
if you hold a trial, there is a debate opened up and the trial is a bit the platform to talk about all these crimes that happened. If you don't hold a trial, then these crimes are forgotten. So this is a bit my philosophical answer to it. It's on. What I'm wanting is, I know the allegations of a million murders in Cambodia or something, or six million in, in Europe. What are the, what was, what, when we're talking of these crimes of, uh, the, what are, are there numbers that, that anyone agrees to for the, uh, the tribunal's uh, scope of jurisdiction? That's what I'm interested in, in terms of what happened to prisoners of war, what happened to uh, sexual uh, slavery, uh, rape, et cetera. Because, it, it, anyway, that's what I was hoping. There might be some statistics out there. Um, if I can just answer, I think in, in the context particularly of the rape of Nanking, this, um, the, the kind of accounting of the dead is an ongoing issue and I think it's, it's one of the issues around, you know, around commemorating Nanking and um, historians writing about Nanking is this kind of massively discrepant um, set of numbers. Uh, which have to do a lot with um, the kind of evidence that is available, um, you know, that would be undisputed. It might be there if people have started doing this um, uh, research very carefully, but the issue was that um, we don't know how many people were in Nanking at the particular time. There was a lot of movement um, of refugees ahead of Japanese troops. There was a lot of people moving in and out, and, and also there was no clear kind of set of numbers for the Chinese population at the time. So, for example, in, in response to um, the question of numbers of dead at Nanking, as we know, um, the Chinese government has a particular number which is disputed by other governments, which is disputed by historians in Japan, um, which we can kind of scoff at, except that when it comes to looking at um, the, the, the numbers, there's careful research being done, which, which um, you know, I invite you to, to uh, read about, which is that just it's very difficult to arrive at a set of numbers. It's very similar in the context, perhaps less um, about prisoners of war than it is about the number of laborers who died um, alongside uh, the Burma Thai Railway, for example. How do we know how many people died? Um, how many people were in, employed, how many people managed to leave ahead of, of the, the, the defeat, how many people died of illness, or we don't actually have those numbers. So the question of evidence is, is much more complicated, um, maybe not much more complicated, but certainly extremely complicated in the context where um, the definition of a combatant, the definition of a civilian, the definition of a resistor is very difficult to make in a number of different contexts. So I'm sorry I can't provide those clear numbers. I wish we could all do that. Now, I just want to say that one reason uh, that Nuremberg provided a relatively re reliable number uh, on the Holocaust, on, um, um, Holocaust victims, and it has to do with the fact that Nuremberg itself was accompanied with a gigantic social uh, uh, science project. I mean, they actually they were hiring experts uh, who um, yeah, explored um, um, the uh, number of uh, civilian casualties. This was one of the reasons why actually Nuremberg was so accurate, uh, retrospectively, it was astonishing. I mean, they, I think they provided a number of 4.3 million Jewish uh, victims. Uh, so the next one is Robert, please. <clears throat> Quick comment on sexual violence and then a comment to uh, Professor Van Lingen. One reason why affront to human dignity was used was that the uh, prosecutors were aware that there were other forms of sexual violence than, than rape. So there was a, a wide range of possibilities that was meant to be encompassed. Uh, but I wanted to take issue with Professor von Lingen's reference to the non-indictment of the emperor for political reasons. I think it's really important to recognize that the choice of all defendants was political and that the choice of not to indict the emperor also had a legal basis. So the, the distinction that many people make between politics and law really doesn't apply in this context. 
Hello, Diane Amen. I'm at the University of Georgia, and I'm a visiting fellow at Oxford this semester. Um, thank you so much for your presentations. They were wonderful. My colleague, Professor Orenlicker, has gotten a number of questions, so I'd like to direct my questions to the other two participants, if I may. Um, Professor von Lingen, I found very interesting your discussion of some of the participants, and particularly um, surfacing that women participated as lawyers at the trials. I'd be curious if you might want to say a little bit more about that, specifically what they did. Were they uh, brief writers? Were they gathering evidence? Were they at the lectern doing examinations and speeches? And then allied with that, um, putting aside the gender line, was there a more diverse participation with regard to race or ethnicity? Um, or was it largely a project of lawyers of European ancestry, whether they were based originally in Europe, America, or Australia? So that would be my question. And then, um, Professor Trefault, uh, I found interesting at the beginning your uh, mention of the Netflix series on the Tokyo War Crimes Trial. Um, I have watched a couple of those episodes. It strikes me as a hero story about uh, Judge Rowling. <laughs> Not surprisingly, it's a Dutch production. Um, I think that is part of the story that we find with why there's a feeling of U.S. centrism because so much of the historiography was created by Americans as to both of these trials. But I wonder if you could comment a little bit more about that series since you've obviously thought about it from your remarks. Uh, you, had, you had some uh, allusions to how it was received in Japan. Uh, and I also wonder if within Japan, is there anything equivalent in popular culture that would have been a Japanese presentation of what the Japanese understanding of that trial was? So thank you. So thank you very much. This is a great question on the female attorneys. Um, however, I have to uh, disclaim that we're just starting research into that. Um, so, and I guess maybe Lisette Schoten is saying a bit more on the Dutch prosecutor tomorrow. So uh, just briefly, they are the prosecutors, so they are responsible for, for whole days. So they will um, have the discussion on the band, the cross-examination, whatever, present evidence. But um, so far, I'd say it is not limited to, let's say, female topics, like them presenting only sexual violence or stuff like that. So it's, it's just doing the ordinary work of prosecutors. And... Um, for example, what regards Komi uh, Strokodantra, um, she is originally from Burma, but in a way she's the, m <laughs> Lizette, I'm sorry, she's maybe the most valuable person in the prosecution team because she's raised in a British system. So she has studied uh, in the UK. So she's familiar with Anglo-Saxon law. This is difficult for the other Dutch prosecutors. So she is, uh, she is um, um, I would say, selected strongly on merit. Um, thank you for that question about um, Tokyo Saiban. Um, we've had a number of interesting discussions about it, um, particularly with my colleague um, Takeda Kayoko, who's been pointing out that it's actually a Japanese production with a Dutch team in charge. Um, but what's interesting, and I, I, I hope that um, we'll see some research on that soon, is to note the difference between the English version, um, the Japanese version, and the subtitling. Um, um, I think there's, um, there's some interesting comments to make about how the language, the respective language um, forms suggest particular hierarchical relationships between um, these, you know, it's mostly, it's a, it's a courtroom drama about the justices. So my point um, that I was making there is that apart from Rowling's relationship with Take Yamamichi, the author of The Harp of Burma, so this kind of you know, lovely friendship that develops along walks on the beach and it's all terribly romantic, etc. But um, Japanese people seem to be largely marginalized. They just appear as these kind of defendants or as um, lawyers in interweave documentary footage. So they're distanced from the action in so many ways, which I, I find quite um, Interesting. On the point of whether there are other, um, the Japanese reception of the, um, the documentary is interesting. I don't sort of really have any 
sense of what to say yet, except there's a lot of dispute about what that means, a lot of dispute about um, what the reactions overseas might be to these trials, whether these reactions are justified, etc. They become very quickly polarized in sort of really you know, extreme ways. Um, what's also interesting is to see the, 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 the earlier manga, for example, there's a manga by um, Kobayashi Yoshinori, who is famous for his right-wing views on PAL, you know, glorifying PAL again and saying this is, you know, this is what we should really be understanding um, the legacy of the Tokyo trial to be. Um, when people read those manga, are they reading them, you know, for entertainment, or are they, I don't know what, how they're reading them, but, but there's an ongoing discussion, um, and it's not often, it's not an academic discussion, it's often a discussion around national identity, around history, around the way in which we might, you know, understand Japan's past, and it takes place in a number of different places, including manga, and, and of course, these kinds of documentaries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, actually, we <coughs> have two minutes left, and have two more um, voices here. Um, so I would like you to, I take you uh, uh, at the same time, and I would like to keep it brief, please. Uh, yes, I will be brief. Uh, David Cohen from Stanford University. Um, on uh, Professor Orenthal here's uh, point, um, going back to the issue of rape as a war crime, I think what makes it particularly mysterious in some ways that it was not specified is that um, when the um, investi uh, war crimes investigation teams for the British and the Australian um, prosecutions um, in Asia Pacific um, did their work, they used a war crimes questionnaire, which was distributed to all the individuals who had been um, in captivity or detention or whatever, and rape is explicitly listed as one of the war crimes on the questionnaire in both the case of the British and the Australians war crimes investigations. So it'd be interesting to look at the internal memoranda um, and to see why then that was not transferred into the actual, um, uh, um, uh, uh, into um, the, formal, the formal framework. It was of course charged as a war crime independently um, in some of the BNC trials or British trials where, it's char where rape is charged as a war crime. On the other, um, the other point about uh, numbers and so forth, I think it's very important not to get distracted by Nanjing and the debate over the numbers in Nanjing. The real question is the scope of the suffering of the Chinese population as a whole, and certainly the devastation caused by the three all campaign, for example, um, uh, just in quantitative terms, um, was in all likelihood much greater than what happened at Nanjing. These things were happening all over China. Um, Nanjing attracted particular attention because of the international community there and their documentation. Likewise, in regard to the comment about the careful documentation in, um, um, at Nuremberg, that may be true in regard to the Holocaust, but the Holocaust was only one part of the war crimes presentation. And the numbers for the Soviet Union in terms of war deaths range between 25 and 50 million. Um, and um, the, uh, that's where a lot more research is required, as it is in the Chinese case, where the numbers range between something like 5 million and 25 million um, civilians who died during Japanese occupation um, as a result of the war. At, uh, at the Tokyo trial, the judges uh, did try to come up with some data, but, uh, but uh, uh, incomplete. And with respect to POWs, uh, based on the, the evidence presented by the prosecution, uh, the, judgment, uh, uh, the judges found that uh, the death rate of the POWs while in Japanese custody was really high, which was about 25, uh, 27% or so. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, uh, that uh, whatever data that the prosecution produced though did not include the death rate with respect, with respect to the uh, Chinese soldiers who fell into Japanese custody. So um, uh, uh, there is much to be uh, researched about, uh, uh, was much to be researched on the part of the prosecution and as well as uh, for the judges in terms of uh, getting, uh, reaching a, a definitive uh, data. Uh, with respect to uh, rape in Nanjing, uh, the judgment uh, reads that uh, about 20,000 women, uh, uh, there are at least 20,000 rape cases uh, uh, in, in Nanjing uh, over the course of the uh, six to eight uh, weeks of uh, uh, the initial phase of the Japanese military occupation of that city. Um, that's uh, uh, though uh, 
20,000 cases that are uh, known to the uh, international observers uh, than in Nanjing, and not necessarily include other cases uh, that may not uh, that are not reported to uh, the uh, uh, the observers there. So there again, we don't have a definitive uh, data, but uh, the the prosecution and the uh, uh, the, the judges try to get the uh, uh, the uh, general scope of the crimes committed by the Japanese. Uh, I guess that's, these are the, the, some of the things I wanted to throw into this uh, discussion. Thank you. Okay. Um, actually, I'm sorry, but we have to uh, close it here. Um, yes, thank you very much for the, to each of the speakers to the excellent contributions, and also thanks a lot to the audience for the engaging discussions. Thanks a lot. <laughs>